really prove that the fault has moved seismically at the moment. Scientists are working very hard to find other ways to analyze the motion of fault planes, but at the moment the only real hard proof for a fault that has moved in the past seismically is the pseudotachylites. So, until now, I have drawn these faults and I have not told, tell, told you how these faults end. In fact, in most of the lectures which were, that you have heard until now, faults are kind of drawn to offset layers, but you were not really explained what happens when you go and continue this fault up or down or along the strike. Well, here is an example. This is in uh, Borneo, an outcrop. The whole thing is maybe about 10 meters or 15 meters high. And down here, you can very clearly see this yellow layer faulted. Okay? So there is a fault. If you go up, you can see this layer faulted. Up again, you can see this layer faulted, this layer faulted. But up here, the fault is gone. It's not there anymore. So what happened? Well, what happened is that we have reached the fault tip. Faults are not structures which continue indefinitely in the Earth. They can actually stop. So down here, there is an offset. And here, the layer is not offset anymore. The fault just terminates. To explain this in a little more uh, detail, I've made this diagram for you. Okay? If you look at this side of this three-dimensional diagram, then there is a fault. But if you go up, at one point, the offset stops. And the layer at that point is not anymore faulted. This point here is called the fault tip. And the fault tip is, in fact, a line. In this case, it is drawn like this here. And it is called the tip line. So faults, in fact, in the Earth are objects which have an end. And the tip of a fault, if you connect it in three dimensions, is called the tip line. And here I listed the damage zone for you and the fault zone. These are the kind of common terms. Faults don't continue forever. I've just explained this to you. But faults are very rarely alone. Faults are accompanied by more and more faults in a kind of a fault set or a fault, faulted area. And between two faults, then automatically you have these areas which are not faulted, and they are called the relays. Relays are the places where you can go from one side to the other without having to cross the fault. Okay, here you have to jump across the fault, but here I can also go around, follow the relay, and go to the other side. And these relays are extremely important for people who study uh, oil exploration or, hydro or water movement, because the relay allows the fluids to flow without having to cross the fault. So, summarizing this, faults are rarely just alone. There are, in cases where you find faults, there are always more faults. And this is a three-dimensional diagram of how such a faulted area could look like. You have fault tips, you have many relays, some faults are big, many other faults are quite small. In fact, there are many more small faults than big ones. And if you look on the side, it is actually surprisingly simple how this structure looks like. But if you look in three dimensions, you get an enormous complexity. And one more time, fault tips are a common feature. There is, in fact, one very, very beautiful example of a fault tip in, that you can watch in Google Earth. 
And on the course website, you will find the link to actually look at this fault. It is also in Arches National Park in Utah. And what you see here in three dimensions is an exposed layer of sandstone. And here it is just one layer. There are lots of fractures in it, but it doesn't concern us. And here, this sandstone is faulted. Okay? So what you have is a sandstone layer, and going away, it splits up. So here is the fault tip, more or less, and going up, the displacement on the fault increases. And if you go to the website, you download the link, and you can move this around, look at it from all the sides, and get a good impression. This picture was made using seismic. I've already shown you an example. This is from the Niger Delta, another area that we are studying here in Aachen. And this is here one layer in profile, and these are the faults which people have interpreted. And this picture is a three-dimensional representation of the layer. Okay, so this here is one horizon, and the green are the faults. And you can see the fault network, you can see the fault tips, like here or here. You can see many relays. Let me find a relay for you, for example, here. You can go from one side to the other across this relay. In the Arches National Park that I've already shown you, there is a very famous relay that you can actually study in the field. In this outcrop here, is the top of a sandstone layer. And on this side, there is a fault. And so this, and this is the same layer. This is the fault. And the fault tip is here, OK? This V here is one fault tipping out there. And on the other side, this is the top of the layer. And it tips out here. OK, so here is one fault with the tip. Here is the other fault with the tip. and this little thing here is the relay. And it is also called a relay ramp because, in fact, standing on the layer down here, I can go up and go climb to the top of this outcrop without ever having to go up the steep fault plane. It is a relay. So, faults have a geometry, faults have a tip, and faults are segmented. What that means is that a fault very rarely is just one plane which is continuous from tip, tip to tip. I will draw it here for you. You might think that this is a fault plane, but in fact, if you look in more detail, you will find that the fault is broken up into different segments. The fault is segmented. In this picture here, these are the segments, and these here are the relays between the segments. So fault planes are segmented. And what you can do if you want to study these segments is you can go along a fault like this and plot the displacement. Here is the fault tip, displacement is zero, displacement D, and distance X. And then the displacement goes up, and the displacement goes down. This is just one of these faults. But many faults, if you look carefully, are not just described by a curve like this, but there are, in fact, many smaller faults which generate this displacement curve. And here is an example. You might study a fault like this here. Here in the middle, the displacement is high. At the tips, the displacement is quite small. And you will find that it is segmented. And each of these segments is a little fault by itself. OK? But if you add up the displacements, and the small segments together form a bigger fault, a segmented fault. Okay. 
What about mechanics of faults? We have not yet talked about stress and strain and why faults actually form. In the last lecture, I have explained to you the rheology of the crust, and I've explained to you the theory that explains why the crust is stronger and stronger when you go down to greater and greater depth, and then it becomes softer and softer because of the increase of the temperature. Folds are typically structures which form in this part of the crust, and down here the crust is more ductile, you might get folds or shear zones. And now the question is why is that? Before we go into the mechanics, I will show you a very simple experiment made with a layer of sand. So this picture is about one square meter, and it is a, it is a thin plate of rubber, which is put on the table, and then on top of this rubber, we spread a layer of about five centimeters of sand and we make it very beautiful and smooth. Okay? Really make it smooth. And then we start to pull on the rubber in the vertical direction. We, start to, we try to pull this down and this up. And if we do that, then the sand by itself automatically forms all these little faults. So the middle between these two faults goes down like a graben, okay? And here, this fault actually forms offset, and we are looking at it from the top now. Eh? So what you see is this, little faults. And if you deform more, then you create a whole set of these faults, these relays, these little graben structures, and so forth, and so forth. And the, the magic here is that apparently, if you pull on this rubber, the sun doesn't want to deform homogeneously. It localizes the deformation spontaneously by itself. In fact, you have all experienced this localization by yourself when you walk on the beach. If you put your foot down into the beach like this, then you create one of these little faults. The sand will actually localize the deformation. You cannot do this in asphalt, for example, or in honey. It will not localize deformation, but sand does. And why that is, is in fact explained very nicely using the Mohr diagrams, which we have uh, learned about in the last lecture. So let's just recap the Mohr diagram. This is the effective normal stress on the horizontal axis, and this is the shear stress on the vertical axis, and this circle, which is the Mohr circle, remember this Mohr circle is basically the collection of normal stress, shear stress combinations on each possible plane in this block. Maybe you remember. Okay, so here is my block. I draw my plane in it. This is the normal to the plane. And on the normal to the plane, I make calculate this stress vector. And this stress vector can be decomposed into a normal stress and a shear stress. And these two are plotted here to give me one point. Okay. And again, in the last lecture, I've explained to you that there is this line, which is defined by the cohesion and the friction angle. And if the Mohr circle is such that it touches the line, then the material starts to deform. And the interesting thing about sand is that it will then automatically form a fault on the plane which is in this point that touches the line. Okay, 